All right, so uh, looks like everyone's got their food. Um, so it's a really good, great pleasure for me today to be introducing Sharon Nunez to you all. Uh, she's the founder and president of a group called Animal Equality that was founded 12 years ago in Spain and are now have offices in eight countries and are working in China as well. And they recently were named one of Animal Charity Evaluator's top three charities uh, for a second year. Um, and some of you may have seen them on campus before with their iAnimal project. It's this virtual reality experience that takes you into different scenarios and environments to actually see things as an animal would see them. And it's a remarkable way of generating a sort of empathetic response. But I first met Sharon four years ago at a uh, farmed animal advocacy retreat. And right when she was getting ready to come here with Jose Valle, who she runs the organization with, and they were going to start a, a U.S. office. And uh, just seeing the enthusiasm they had and the approach, um, and then getting to know her better over the years, and then later seeing her at the Animal Rights Conference, where she was talking about how to run an effective organization. And, uh, you know, there can be a fair amount of drama with different animal protection groups. And at AR, that sort of gets a little concentrated. Uh, but in her talk, she was talking about how at the time they had close to 50 employees and they had almost zero turnover in the previous five years. And she said, uh, well, in her view, it all came down to treating your staff with kindness. And I think uh, as of now, they've grown to nearly having about 80 people working for them and more and more on the way. And it just shows just sort of the ethos of not only her approach generally to the world and to this work, but how to you know, treat everyone around her better. So please join me in welcoming Sharon from Animal Equality. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here today. Firstly, I want to thank the Harvard Student Animal Legal Defense Fund and the Harvard Animal Law and Policy Program. And of course, the wonderful and my dear friend, Chris Green, who I've learned so much from in the last few years. So I want you to raise your hands if you're part of the Animal Law Program, Animal Law Program here in Harvard. Okay, cool, excellent. Okay, so today I'm going to be speaking about animal equality, our strategic approach, the countries we're working in, the situation of animals in those countries, and what we are doing to help animals. And there will be room for questions and comments. So, animal equality. Animal equality is a team that works in eight countries around the world, and we believe in a world where all animals are respected and protected. We're an international organization, and we work with society, governments, and companies to end cruelty to farmed animals. Animal equality is focused on farmed animals, animals that are raised and killed for food. Over 56 billion farmed animals are raised and killed for food every year, and they endure the most harrowing lives. Their lives are brutal, and their deaths are even worse. And this number, 56 billion, doesn't even include fish or other sea creatures that are counted by the tons. So, animal equality is an effective altruist organization. We want that every person that works at our organization, we're currently a team of over 70 people worldwide, every volunteer that volunteers at animal equality, or every person that gives a dollar to the organization is assured that we are doing what we can to reduce as much suffering as possible. That is why we focus on farmed animals. If we look at this graphic, we can see the number of animals that are raised and killed for food in the United States. We can see that the numbers are not comparable to the animals that are raised and killed in shelters, for clothing, or in labs. Unfortunately, if we compare this with the attention and the money these animals get, we can see that there is a vast difference. Of course, for us, all animals are important. All animals are individual sentient beings. They all deserve respect and consideration. That is why it is our mission to spare as many as possible. If we look at the number of land animals killed annually by the average American consumer, we can see that over 94% of those animals are chickens. Again, this leaves out fish, the biggest victims of our consumption. Over 90% 
of animals killed by, for direct or indirect consumption by the average American diet are fish or other sea creatures. So we are focused on animals that are raised and killed for food. They die in the largest number. They experience the most terrible lives. They have the least resources dedicated, dedicated to them. And we can also track the success of our campaigns. So animals raised and killed for food, but within these, we have specific strategic priorities. Animal equality strategic priorities are caged hens. These are the animals with others that you will see in a minute that get most of our resources and attention. I myself have been in dozens of caged hen farms in Spain, in India, and in other countries. This hen will spend two years in this cage. She will not be able to move. She will not be able to spread her wings. Her feathers will rub against the metal cage, and she will probably get featherless. Her feet will suffer deformities and get crippled because she will spend her entire life, those two years I mentioned, standing on bars, standing on metals. After two years, she will be brought to slaughter, where she will be killed. And a high percentage of animals around the world that are killed are fully conscious. So it is animal equality's strategic priority to end the use of cages for hens. And we'll see how we do that in a minute. Broiler chickens, animals that are raised and killed for meat. As we see, as we saw, 90% of the animals, of the land animals that are raised and killed for meat around the world, but most specifically in the United States, are chickens. For these animals, their body is their cage. They are selectively bred to grow so fast in such a short period of time that like this fellow, they cripple and fall because of the weight of their own body. Most of them die because they can't reach food or water at the farm. Actually, five times more chickens die in farms before reaching slaughter than if we combine all other forms of animal exploitation. So if we add up the animals that are raised and killed in labs, so for vivisection, for clothing, for in shelters, that will be a number that will be five times lower than the amount of chickens that die in factory farms before reaching slaughter because of the condition. In the United States, this chicken will spend the six months of his life on litter. This litter is not changed, and the air is full of ammonia that makes it difficult for him to breathe. So it's animal equalities Second animal that we're mostly focused on are chickens that are raised and killed for meat. And thirdly, of course, sorry, this is, this is the amount of chickens that are being killed at this instance. And I want to show you footage of an investigation we, re we recently presented in the United Kingdom inside the chicken industry. Yeah, I want to warn you, the footage is quite shocking.
Thank you for watching. Thank you for bearing witness. It's the third animals that we are focused on, that the organization is focused on, are farmed fish, what is called aquaculture. So sometimes we are asked, okay, well, why farmed fish and not wild-caught fish? Well, it's true that wild-caught fish have brutal deaths. Many of them um, spend several minutes, several hours before they die. But they have a relatively good life in the wild. In the case of farmed fish, they suffer from over overcrowding in the farms, from diseases, from parasites. And as we will see in this video, oh, sorry. It's not allowing me to. Okay, oh, sorry. Okay, don't, don't worry. Anyway, the video is not available. So um, this is a fish farm, in, I think it's in Vietnam. And basically there is tens of thousands of fish in this farm. The water is incredibly polluted. Now, the problem with pollution and water in fish farms is that fish gills are, uh, they have been evolutionary selected so they can absorb more oxygen. So of course, uh, the water pollution causes them tremendous problems. It is also filled with parasites and diseases. Actually, with this photo that I, sh I showed you before, this fish is being eaten alive at a fish farm by parasites. So, caged hens, broiler chickens, and farmed fish are the animals that animal equality uses most of its resources to help. We have, yeah, just wanted to show you this too. So at the moment, we can see that aquaculture, well, this was in 2010, the amount of uh, animals that were fish farmed or fish that were fish farmed was a little bit smaller. It was smaller than the animals that were caught in wild fisheries. But if we look at the trend by 2050, we can see a significant increase in aquaculture. Okay, so as I said, caged hens, broiler chickens, and fish farms, farm fish. What are our strategic priorities? They are our strategic priorities, but what is our focus? These are our strategic lines. Animal equality focuses on corporate outreach. So we work with companies to try to get them to eliminate some of the worst forms of cruelty, usually from their supply system. We are currently focused on ending cages for hens from the supply system of many companies around the world. And we also work with companies to try to get them to introduce more plant-based products and meat alternatives. Legislation. So we work with governments around the world to try to get them to introduce better laws for animals. And we also work getting them to enforce the laws that already exist. Education. We educate the public. And we not only motivate them, we not only show them, how they can help animals, but we also tell them and show them how they can do it. And investigations. Investigations feed into all of our strategic lines. Thanks to all this, as Chris mentioned, Animal Equality was considered this year a top charity by animal charity evaluators. We are considered one of the most effective charities in the world. Okay. So, animal equality works around the world to reduce the suffering of animals. We are currently working in four European countries, in India, in Brazil, in the US, and Mexico. I want to show you the situation of these animals around the world, and I want to specifically show you the work we are doing to help these animals. Okay, of course, Europe isn't a country, as you can see in this graphic, but animal equality is working in five of the countries that have more million live farmed animals at this moment. We are working in four European countries, the United States, India, Brazil, and Mexico. So, India. India is the third country in the world with the largest amount of farmed animals. At this very moment, I just came back from India. I was there two weeks ago. 
I was in a city called Pune and in a city called Udaipur. In India at this very moment, there is 300 million cows and buffaloes alive. When you walk around the streets of India, you see cows, you see buffaloes. As many as you probably know, the slaughter of cows and calves is prohibited. But this causes big animal welfare problems. There's not only the abuse of the dairy industry, a percentage of Indian population is vegetarian, but very few people are vegan. Most people, most families consume dairy products. And when you walk in the streets of India, you can see the cows and the cows, and they're eating plastic. They get hit by cars. They're not put down because it's against the law. And they don't receive any veterinary care. There was recent, recently a story in the media that they had found 40 pounds of plastic in the stomach of a cow. And this happens because cows aren't like dogs or other animals when they're eating, and they usually are eating the rubbish in the streets. They can't tell the difference between plastic. They, they're not able to differentiate, and it ends up in their system. In India, the Provincial to Cruelty to Animals Act exists. And that protects animals to a certain extent. For example, it prohibits the use of battery cages. The problem, the big problem in India is enforcement. I myself have been in battery caged farms, hen farms in India, and most of them were battery caged. It is calculated by Compassion and World Farming that 78% of the hens in India are currently living in cage systems. India banned dolphin captivity in 2013. And as I mentioned, one of the big problems in the country is enforcement. So a lot of people, a lot of us, think about India as the land of vegetarians. And it is. It's the country in the world with the most vegetarians, with 35 to 40% of the population being vegetarian. But meat consumption is growing, especially poultry meat consumption. This is a map of the countries that are going to be increasing or gro growing their demand for poultry meat by 2030. As you can see, India is the country in the world that will most increase their demand for poultry meat. When I was in India last year, I sat down with a group of students and I asked them about their diet, their dietary habits. And they told me that all of them ate meat. And I asked why. And they said, well, our parents are vegetarian, but we don't really think that we need, we think that we need the protein and, and we think that it's cool to eat meat. So that is one of the big things that is happening in India is that younger populations, the younger people are eating more meat. They're generally not eating meat like in the West. An average Indian family would eat maybe meat once a week, but still we can see what this is going to mean for animals from here to 2030. So what is animal equality doing in India? Well, first, legislation. It's a great country because there is an interest in animal welfare. The prime minister of India himself is vegetarian. So animal equality did an investigation into foie gras farms in France, Spain, and Italy in 2012. And we took our executive director in India, took this footage to the Indian government, and thanks to that, we managed to ban, to help ban the importation of foie gras in the country. India became the first country in the world to ban the importation of this product. We are now working with the government to get new rules for hens and chickens in the country, also after one of our investigations. These rules aren't perfect, but they provide recommendations on things like veterinary care, the amount of chickens that should be in the farms, etc. Investigations. So investigations is one of our key focuses. Since the founding of animal equality, we have investigated over 700 facilities, animal facilities around the world. In India, animal equality presented the first dairy investigation with our team of investigators there visiting over 140 dairy farms. Now this shocked the Indian public that thinks that it's milk is humanely produced, but it isn't. There was not only widespread mistreatment of these animals with beatings and using electrical pods to get them to move. 
And a lot of the farms, the cows were living on their own filth. They had no veterinary care. And because of this investigation, it was out on some of the most important media channels in India. It reached over 300 million people. Animal equality also presented the first K-10 investigation in India. And with our work with companies, we are working with companies in India to get them to move away from cage systems for hens. We are currently campaigning against McDonald's. Mexico. Mexico is the ninth country in the world with the largest amount of farmed animals. With a total of six, 654 million farmed animals alive at this instance. The Federal Criminal Code of Mexico does not contain any animal welfare provisions at all. There is no animal welfare provisions for Mexico on an, in Mexico for animals in a national level. There are animal welfare laws and provisions across states, but they vary greatly. In Mexico, there is two types of slaughterhouses, municipal and state slaughterhouses. I'll talk about our investigations in Mexico that our team in Mexico has done. But municipal slaughterhouses in Mexico are films of a nightmare. Pollution is a big problem in Mexico and something that we need to analyze when we're thinking about our strategy in this country. Because Mexico City is considered one of the most polluted cities in the world. That is something I didn't say about India and that we're also going to be tackling. But New Delhi, the levels of pollution in New Delhi are so high that it's considered a city where people should not be living in. So that is, as you know, a lot of the pollution is caused, caused by the animal agriculture industry and it's a big problem in developing countries. And there is some enforcement on a state level for the laws I talked about that exist in Mexico on a state level, but they're mainly fines. So what is animal equality doing in Mexico? Most importantly, investigations. Animal equality did an investigation where we visited slaughterhouses across seven states in Mexico. We filmed workers killing pigs with axes. Most of the animals, 100% of the animals, actually I was just looking at the information this morning, in municipal slaughterhouses, were still conscious when they were being killed. They were fully conscious, and some of them took over 30 minutes to die. They were just knifed on the side. So we took this footage to the government. We took it to the media. It had huge media coverage. And we took it to the government. And animal equality introduced with the Senator Viva Gastelum from the party in government in Mexico, key legislation or we helped introduce key legislation. It hasn't been passed by Congress, yes, but it was introduced in the Senate that would make it a crime to abuse animals in Mexico. Animal Equality also carried out the first investigation inside caged uh, hen farms in Mexico and the first investigation inside dairy farms, visiting dairy farms again throughout the country. Because of the results of our investigation inside caged farms, and the work of our corporate outreach team in Mexico, we have managed to get five companies, including the ones you can see, Pagasa, Manyar, Pacific Star, Grupo, Anderson, to eliminate cages in Mexico from their supply system. To eliminate cages from their supply system. Food policy. This is another of our strategies in Mexico. As I mentioned before, pollution is a huge problem in Mexico, with Mexico City being one of the most contaminated cities in the world. We are actually working with the government of Jalisco, that is a, Mexico, a Mexican state, and the biggest, Mexican, the biggest producer of meat, the biggest state producing meat in, the, in, the, in Mexico. The state of Jalisco has agreed to reduce their pollution 50% by 2040. And we are working with them at the moment to try to get them to introduce meatless Mondays and other meat alternatives in public, in public places. And we're also working in education. We have seen that most Mexican students and Mexican millennials are incredibly interested in animal welfare, in trying vegetarianism, and in veganism. Only last year, we handed out 250,000 leaflets in universities. 
And we worked with celebrities such as Sofia Cisniega in the photo that presented our eye animal virtual reality film in Mexico. Okay, so we've talked about India, we've talked about Mexico. What about Brazil? Brazil is the fourth country in the world with the largest amount of farmed animals. And it's one of the top producers and exporters of meat products in the world, specifically beef and chicken. What we are finding in Brazil, we just started working in Brazil about a year ago. We started doing corporate outreach work and our executive director that is going to be doing legislation, education and corporate outreach started, uh, came, came on board in September 2017. What we have seen is that there is huge interest by the media in Brazil. Currently, there's a huge discussion in the media in Brazil about live export that is taking animals from Brazil to the Middle East. There are some provisions for animals under the Constitution that protect them from suffering. And there is good news, especially in Sao Paulo. That's where we have our head office. Sao Paulo banned the testing of animals for cosmetic and cosmetics in 2014, becoming the first state in Latin America to ban this. And of course, there's the Amazon that is being destroyed because the land is being used to create crops to feed animals that then feed people. Okay, so what is animal equality doing in Brazil? Well, corporate outreach in Brazil working with companies to try to get them to eliminate cages for hens from their supply system has been an incredible success. We have won 17 policies in the country. We have gotten the biggest meat company in the world, GBS, to eliminate cages from their supply system. Animal Equality presented the first ever investigation inside caged farms in Brazil. And we are currently working with politicians to try to get a ban for, hen, for, for, a ban for cages for hens. And the European Union, that is where I'm from. I'm half Irish and half Spanish, and I've spent most of my life in Spain. So they say that the European Union is ahead of other countries or ahead of other continents when it comes to animal welfare. And it is, but it isn't. In the European Union, we have countries like Austria or the UK that are leading the way, banning fur farming, banning mutilations, and banning all cages for animals. But we also have countries like Spain, where bullfighting is still part of a tradition and the culture. In the European Union, there was a ban on battery cages. There's a trick to this that even though battery cages were banned, they were substituted by enriched cages, which are cages for hens that are a little bit bigger, and the hens have a few perches, but basically the hens are living under the same conditions. And the banned gestation crates. Now, again, gestation crates are banned after the fourth week of the sow's pregnancy. And of course, there, is big there was a ban, sorry, on veal crates in 2006, and there's big differences across the countries, as we have seen. So animal equality started in Europe, and we we're working in four countries. So what is animal equality doing in the European Union? First, corporate outreach. So we're working with companies in the European Union to eliminate cages for hens. And only in one year, only in 2017, we have gotten 22 company, companies to eliminate cages from their supply sister. Companies like Grupo Pam, Baloco, Corte Inglés, they, you may not, they not, may not sound familiar to you, but they are some of the most important companies in Europe. Investigations. Throughout our 10 years in existence, we have visited over 700 animal exploitation facilities. And we have presented over 60 investigations in the European Union. We're currently, as I said, only focused on farmed animals but we have investigated the use of animals in circuses, in zoos, we've investigated the foie gras industry, the chicken industry, the hen industry, etc. And there is a lot that can be done and that is being done on, at the European Parliament level. So Animal Equality was involved in an initiative last year, we worked with other groups, and we worked with a European parliamentarian called Stefan Eck, and we managed to get animal welfare improvements for over 370 million rabbits in Europe. 
rabbit meat is highly consumed in countries like France, Italy, and Spain in Europe. And this law paves the way to ending cages for rabbits in Europe. Rabbits in Europe are kept in cages to, in very similar circumstances to hens. And we're currently involved in a campaign to end pig mutilations. Pigs are routinely castrated, their teeth are clipped, and their tails are docked, all of it without anesthesia. It is part of the system of raising pigs for meat. Uh, we also work on education, and we do education on two levels. So on the level of the European Parliament. This is an exposition we did last year of factory farming in Europe, and we brought our eye animal headsets, and we had dozens of members of the European Parliament try the headsets and experience firsthand what it's like to be an animal in a farm in Europe, and we also had an exposition of photos. And we also educate citizens through online and offline education. Another of the focus in Europe is enforcement with the laws that already exist in countries like the UK. We did an investigation and presented an investigation in December 2016 inside a dairy farm in the UK where dairy workers were beating and kicking baby calves. We presented it to the media and it got to the courts. And one of the farmers that was involved in this abuse got sentenced on two counts of animal cruelty. Now, the picture that you can see here is probably part of, one, is part of one of the most horrible investigations that I have ever seen. It was footage that was sent to the organization. It was a pig farm in Spain. And the pig farmers were killing pregnant sows with swords, with no anesthesia. And then they were taking pictures of themselves. This was one of the biggest cases of animal cruelty and abuse in Spain. And it got the first and longest prison sentence for animal cruelty in the country. So, I want to finish on a positive note. We are an effective altruist organization. As I said, we want to spare as many lives as possible. And we do that in a number of ways. But one of the ways we do it is telling stories. So today, I want to tell you the story of Lewis. Please watch. This is Lewis. He is a so-called broiler chicken. Okay. This beautiful young rooster was destined to become chicken meat. But luckily, his fate took an unexpected turn. Lewis was raised on a chicken farm alongside thousands of other baby chicks. In modern factory farming, chickens like Lewis are specifically bred to gain as much weight as possible. This extreme rapid growth results in cardiovascular problems, skin sores, and painful leg injuries. Due to the horrible living conditions, many of the birds die inside these farms. Others are killed by farm workers. Undercover footage taken by animal equality investigators tells the story of weak, sick, or injured chicks who are systematically being crushed, beaten to death, or discarded alive in German chicken farms. This would have been the fate of Lewis and his three brothers. Their legs couldn't cope with the weight of their own bodies anymore. In farms like these, that is a death sentence. Animal equality investigators decided to rescue the injured chicks and give them the chance of a new life. The chicks were exhausted and dehydrated. They were brought to a sanctuary where they were taken care of and nursed for several weeks. Thanks to the love and care they received, Lewis and his brothers are fully recovered. they can now spend the rest of their lives in freedom. Lewis has become a proud young rooster. Today, nothing remains of the weak baby chick destined to be thrown out like trash. 
Lewis's new life is just getting started. Thank you for watching. And I want to end with two important resources. Oops, no, not Lewis again. Here. I want to end with two important resources. So we are very excited, and we have our wonderful International Director of Communications here with us. She will be able to give you more information. We are very excited because we have launched La Veg, that is an incredible platform for all things vegan. And we have also launched a meal planner. So um, it's a resource that I recommend you all, uh, you all visit. And um, I also want to talk to you about iAnimal. So iAnimal is our virtual reality project. And we are taking these headsets. I don't know, raise your hand if you've tried our virtual reality project. OK, a few of you have. OK. So we are taking these headsets, as you saw, to the European Parliament. We've taken it to the British Parliament. And we're also taking it to universities around the world. We have just launched a program where we are going to be sending the headsets to students, to university students, so they can use it as part of their outreach. So if anyone is interested in having a headset and using it as part of their outreach, please let us know. OK, so um, a lot of you here, I, I know you, and, and I know you dedicate your, your life, part of your time, to animals. Others are thinking, well, how can I help animals with my life? I just want to let you know that this is probably one of the most important causes. In the case of farmed animals, as we have seen, there is very, very few people who are dedicated to them. So I hope this talk has inspired you or inspires you a little bit to take your activism for animals one step further. Thank you very much. Questions? For, we've got time for questions. If, please raise your hand and wait till the mic comes around so we can get you recorded. Thank you. I'm just curious. How do you get permission to go into these factories and film? Sorry, I, I didn't know. How, how do you get permission to go into the factories to film? Oh, well, I, unfortunately, I can't disclose a lot of information <laughs> because uh, then we may not be able to go into uh, factories and film. Um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I can't. I can't disclose a lot of information. I'm sorry. Any other questions? Yeah. I'll just speak up if that's No, okay. we we're recording, so please wait for mine. Just wanted to know if you're working directly in the United States and if you have made contact with national public media. National Public Radio and Television. Thank you. I let um, Sarah, our, our International Director of Communication, answer about media. Yes, we are working in the United States. Um, uh, two of our staff members, our general counsel, uh, Kaylin LaBarge and Sarah Pickering, uh, are working from here in Boston. And we have an office in uh, Los Angeles where we have uh, 12 people working. We're currently doing education in the United States. So we launched Love Veg, and we're taking our eye animal tour to universities throughout California and sending headsets. Uh, to, uh, to students, and then we're going to be doing um, campaigning, um, corporate outreach campaigning, and we're also going to be doing investigations uh, in the United States this year. And I'll let Sarah talk about the media. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So the media so far have tended to cover eye animals. So the New York Times last year ran an article on how animal rights organizations had a new tool in their arsenal, and that it was this virtual reality experience. Um, so that's been what the media in the US is primarily focused on, um, television, radio, and uh, newspapers. But we're actively starting investigations in the US this year, which will really help us leverage our media contacts and get them to cover it, the undercover investigations that we do here. Um, but some media in the US have covered investigations that we've done elsewhere, usually when there's a link to um, a company or a supply chain that comes into the US, and we can make that connection um, to get coverage. Uh, 
Hi, thanks so much again for coming. That was a great talk. Um, I just wanted to ask how you respond to potential imperialist accusations when you're going into these countries, because I'm sure that's a common um, comment that's brought up by leaders in those countries. Sure. So yeah, that is a great question. Um, so first of all, we have a team of 12 international directors who basically uh, set the strategy plan, um, and that includes people from 13 different countries. So um, all of our directors are heavily involved in the decision making, the strategy, and the goals of the organization. We have executive directors that are local in each one of these countries, and these executive directors are empowered to do the work in their country. So they set their goals based on our strategy plan. Um, they are managing their teams, they're managing their office, they're making strategic decisions about the organization. Um, so we, um, our investigations are done by local teams and then when we, there is a strategic discussion, we are always listening to our executive directors. I mean, we wouldn't be a successful animal organization if it weren't because we trust and we listen to our directors. There was, there's no way that someone in the US or in Europe can come up with these strategies. Um, these strategies need to be implemented and they need the feedback from uh, the people in, in those countries. So that is, um, I think, yeah, what we're doing. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you so much for speaking about your work. I really Thank admire you. what you do. Thank you. Um, your focus on the three, the th your three main animals that you're focusing on, it sounds very familiar to, similar to what the Humane League does. Mm -hmm. Do you have any collaborations or? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Humane League is one of the, our sister organizations, one of the organizations we admire the most. Uh, we are constantly in contact. Um, the reason why these are our strategic priorities, and I, I mean, I don't know if they are the Humane League strategic priorities, like if they present it that way, they probably are, is because we're both effective altruist organizations. So what an effective altruist organization wants to do is make sure that all of the resources of the organization are being used efficiently and are sparing as many lives as possible. And these are the animals that are dying in the largest number. We're also uh, members of the Open Wing Alliance that is a coalition uh, created by the Humane League uh, to end cages for hens. So yeah, they're, they're a wonderful organization. We admire them very much and, and we're in close collaboration. Anyone else? Well, I'll ask a quick question. Oh, there you go. It, well, I'm getting over there. You can answer this one. Um, what is it so far since you first started 12 years ago? Which of your successes are you most proud of? And if money and resources are no object, what would you most like to accomplish? <laughs> well, that's a very, it's a very big question. Um, so I think that what... Um, I think what the organization and, and what I'm most proud of is the team we've put together. I think that, I mean, we really, I feel we have an incredible team with experts in their field, experts in the different countries, and that are just doing, who are completely dedicated and committed to, uh, to saving animals. I think that putting this incredible team of people in the room and having them all in the same organization is very unique. So that is that is not one of my accomplishments. That's something I've I've helped, but it's mostly because I think because of the organization and because of them. Um, and then your second question was: so if money weren't an impediment, um, I think that it's very important for organizations to start looking at China. Um, we are kind of timidly looking at China, at work we can do there. But it's, um, it's the first country in the world that has the most farmed animals. And um, I think that if, if money weren't a problem, we would probably try to um, um, hire an executive director in, um, in the country and, and think of a, it would probably take six months or a year, but a, a strategy that really works to, um, to spare lives in the country. So I think that's what, that was what we would do. So I have a question about redundancy, and I don't, yeah. I'd like to know your attitude toward it. Sure. I mean, things like factory farm investigations are nothing new, right? Yeah. So is it important to continue to do them, or should there? And I mean, the, the, the virtual uh, reality is sort of a new technology, right? Yeah. But I'm just wondering if there's any point in animal protection agencies getting together and deciding not to repeat what has already been done. But possibly to just provide a greater space mm -hmm. for those that, that the information that has already become available. 
Mm -hmm. That that is a very important question, and yes, you're absolutely right. And um, we are already in conversation with a lot of organizations to make sure that there's no redundancy. So, for example, in some of our European countries, we're constantly meeting organizations in those countries to make sure that we're doing different investigations, that we're not presenting investigations at the same time, and that there's space between investigations. Having said that, um, I think that investigations, and specifically farmed animal investigations, is one of the most powerful tools that we have in our toolbox to help animals. And I think that even if, every, if out of every 10 investigations we do, two don't get a lot of media attention and two are redundant, the truth is that when we are doing investigations like in India and dairy farms that gets 300 million reach in the media, or in Spain, we just presented an investigation with the most important, the Michael Moore of Spain, one of the most important journalists in the country, and we went undercover with him, and this has sparked one of the biggest food scandals in the country. This does not happen when we're talking about, I don't know, what, in my experience, this happens when there is footage of inside the farms. So I think that there is maybe the risk of some redundancy. It can be solved to a great extent with a lot of communication with other organizations, and, and we try to do that, and I think we're doing that quite well. But also, they are so powerful. They help move so many people that I really think it's important that we continue to focus on farmed animal investigations. Thank you. Thank you for a really fantastic talk and thank you for thank all you that so you much. do. Thank you. I'm interested to hear what you think lawyers can best do to support the work of your organization in addition to donating to support the work you do around the world. Thank you so much. I will let our Kaylin Labarge, who's our general counsel, answer that question if she doesn't mind. Great question, thank you. Um, and it's wonderful to be in a room with so many lawyers and future lawyers who are interested in farmed animal welfare and animal welfare in general. Um, lawyers play a huge part in animal activism. Um, everything from my role supporting the organization, compliance, um, you know, the, the non-animal aspects of, of helping an organization like animal equality, but also um, petitions to enforce consumer protections um, uh, helping the organization release an investigation, petitions to law enforcement to um, crack down on any violations of animal cruelty laws that we find. Um, so, and, and just volunteering your time. There's, there's not a lot of animal law positions out there. It's still a very small field, but um, interning, offering pro bono services, to organizations like Animal Equality uh, can be incredibly valuable to organizations like that. And, and yeah, so anything that um, you're interested in, I'm happy to provide my email to Chris and um, offer to, to speak with you one-on-one -on -one if you're interested in getting involved. Any other further questions? Well, we've had people who need to leave for class uh, at one o'clock anyway, so please join me in thanking Sharon Nunez Thank one you. more time. Thank you, thank you. I left my card here if anyone is interested and you have my email too, so please feel free to send me an email. Thank you.